You know, my tooth has not had one bit of change. But number one, your prayers have helped, though it's not, it's not perfect, but I've learned certain things you can put in your mouth and they'll just sort of melt. Like, like chocolate. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm getting so fat lately. All right. Roundy. Oh, very cute. Very cute. Touche. All right. <laughs> he and I have talked much about quick wit. And I actually surrendered to the fact that I think he's quicker than I am, although I'm quick on the draw, though. All right, now we want to talk about a change of kingdoms involving life and death. In other words, <clears throat> the, <laughs> the way that this change of kingdoms has taken place is not just, oh, I'm, you know, I renounce you, Satan, as my Lord, and I'm going to, Jesus, I, now I want you to be my Lord. That's true, but folks, there is a death to the old kingdom, not just a renouncing. The renouncing comes after you're sure of the death. You've been delivered from the power of darkness. And, um, and you know, it doesn't, it doesn't void out the old things that we were taught how to handle stuff. It doesn't void that out. It, it just puts it on the proper ground, the ground of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. There. That's the starting point where the victory is already won, and then you'll get a manifestation of that. All right. So I'm just going to keep standing up here and eating chocolate. And I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to do it. A change of kingdoms involving life and death. The part of Romans 6 that deals with our uh, with our being instruments of Christ is at the end of the chapter, right? We started in verse 15. But, but before it talks about you and I being instruments or yielding to the nature of Christ, on the, uh, but before that and on the basis of it, the scriptures have previously set forth the truth of our death with Christ. Now, if you know anything about Romans 6, you know that um, from verse 1 all the way down at least to verse 11, and obviously far, farther than that, but those are the most clear, it is very much emphasizing your death with Christ. Okay, now, let me let me try to just help you to see this. All right, so you got you got Romans. Uh, well, we're, we were talking last class about the last part of Romans. We're talking about verse 15 through 23. And Romans 6, 15 through 23 is talking about yielding ourselves to Christ, not yielding ourselves to sin, all right? And that's, and that's what it's talking about, and being instruments of him, being servants to whom we obey, all of that stuff. Okay. Well, you hear that. You hear that a lot in church. You hear different people saying stuff, not necessarily our church, but in churches. You hear, you hear that emphasized a lot without Romans, the first part, which is verses 1 through, and I'm just using 11 for, for, for now because those absolutely are undeniable. In other words, before we ever talk about yielding, or, or if you just wanted to, to make my little chart more clear, you could X out the thought of 
servanthood and all that. And that's, or you could just make it <laughs> yield. Is that, did I spell it right, Mallory? I need your help. All right. And over here is death. Now, so there's, so the verses 15 to the end of the chapter are talking about yielding, being servant instruments to his life and all this kind of stuff, right? Okay. But before that is put forth so strong that I, could, I can't emphasize it enough, there is this necessity and this emphasis by Paul that is making sure that, look, first there has to be a death before there can be a yielding to a life. First there has to be a death to an old king before there can be a yielding to a new king. First, there has to be a death to an old kingdom before there can be a new king. First, there has to be a break with an old dominion by death before there can be a yielding. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. And for the, for the most part, that's left out when people talk about just yielding to the Lord. Yeah. It's left out. But Paul didn't leave it out, and the Bible doesn't leave it out. And if we care anything about the truth, as it is, uh, the truth of the Bible, then we will not preach the back part and leave out the front part. Amen. All right. Some people say, <clears throat> "Well, Randy, all you people do over there is just emphasize death." Yeah, well, what are you emphasizing? Well, we're just yielding to Christ. Yeah, how's that going for you? You know, is that working for you pretty good? No, it's not, and they know it. You know, maybe some don't yet, but they will. You know what I mean? And just time is a great, you know. That's right. <laughs> Kelly, do you have a comment? Just thank you about your article. How you have to be obedient to your death with Christ before there can be any obedience to fulfill life. Or, you know, you can't, you have to be obedient to the death. Yeah. That was your article. So. Yeah. Yeah. That article on obedience was all about being obedient unto death. Because if you're obedient unto death and the only life you got is Christ, you'll yield. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> all right. And that's a that's sort of a a little bare summary of that actually. There's a lot more that goes with it though. Yeah. All right. Um, so so before there is that truth of yielding, there has to be from the scriptures a grasping or a desire to grasp the truth of our death with Christ. Once that has taken place, then we are servants to obey because we function as members of his body. Because, you see, oh, this is not, oh, I know I say this all the time and I get tired of it too. This is not about, this is not about Christianity. It's about Christ. We, we were made member. We are the body of Christ. That's what happened to us. Christ is the life of his body. We're his body. When we acknowledge that, and when I say acknowledge, I don't mean just, okay, I'll do that. I mean by the power of the Holy Spirit revealing it to us, in us, and, you know, getting us with, with God's truth and not Randy's truth or new creation's truth or Acts truth, God's truth. Then, you know, then you realize that, that it's not, we're not just... Christian people, you know, Christian people have nothing if it's not Christ formed in them. If you're not the body of Christ, if, if you're not the temple of the living God, if, if he's not the vine and you're the branch through whom it all brings forth fruit, if you're not the bride and he's the, you know what I mean? I mean, on and on and on and on. All the examples of what we are corporately are vessels. We're vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And we have it for one purpose, so that the power will be him, not us. And yet, 
when in the realm of the teaching of Christianity, we talk about yielding, there's no, there's no looking to the cross to end the old kingdom, and there's no looking to Christ as the new kingdom. All right. See, I don't, I don't even fault, I don't fault over messing those things up. My area were of concern is that I want Jesus. I want Jesus. I don't want, you know, a religion. I don't want to be religious. I don't. I don't want to be religious. I want it to be Christ, and if it's not Christ, I don't want it. I mean, I, that's the way I feel. That's the way I feel, and it's like, you know, when I see Christianity without Christ, I don't get critical of it, of the withoutness of it, that meaning what they, what's what's not Christ, but that they don't have Christ. It's not like, well, I've got something and you don't have. Man, I don't feel that way at all. We all have something, and we all can embrace it and go after it, and we don't have to be snooty about it, you know? So when, you know, and so let me just clarify what, like I have a million times before, you know, I'm not talking about putting or putting down other people or their teachings or whatever. I'm talking about lifting up Christ higher than what we have him already. However that translates. All right. So once that has taken place, then we are servants to obey because we function as members of his body, empowered by his life, to serve his behest, to serve his nature. And when I say his behest, I'm talking about, what does that scripture say? And Paul said something about being moved by the bowels of Jesus Christ, not his own. Meaning he's... he's his compassions are coming from Jesus. And he knows this is Christ. This isn't just being doing the, the Christian thing. <clears throat> you know, and I, again, I know how terrible all that sounds. But, I, but, I, but Jesus is worth being divided out from everything and identified and focused on. That's the way I feel. <laughs> God help me. All right, true freedom from the old bondages only emerges out of the realm of death by crucifixion with Christ. Romans 6, you know, therefore we are, well, uh, verse 6, uh, verse 3, I mean, 6, verse 3, know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Okay, this isn't talking about water baptism. Water isn't even mentioned here. It's not. It's not mentioned anywhere in chapter 6 because it's not talking about water baptism. However, water baptism is a picture of this. But why talk about the picture when you can talk about the real? Amen? So you don't need to mention water. You just mention the reality. All right. Well, what did he say? Don't you know? This is, you know, know ye not? Don't you know? Don't you know this? Christians, don't you know? Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? That means that when you were baptized into water, you're acknowledging something. You're not just going, hey, let's get wet for Jesus. You know what I mean? I mean, doesn't it just mean that? If, I mean, if, if there's not this true meaning, then... It's just let's get wet for Jesus because he commanded it and we want to be Christians so we, we're going <clears> to <throat> do what he says. There's meant to be an understanding and that's why Paul says, no, you're not. He, he, would, he wouldn't have said that if it was a common practice to get baptized in water and not understand that it, was, it all meant that when you went down, he came up. <clears throat> 
you know, that's why I present this to people. And whenever we're baptizing in water anywhere, like Turner Fall, I, I present this to people beforehand because there are people who've been baptized years and years and years ago, and they go, huh, could I be, could I be baptized again? Because they want, they want it to be the reality of what God meant in his heart when it happened and not just some ritual that I'm faithfully keeping for the for the good Jesus. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> true liberty in Christ only comes forth by the life of Christ. Amen. So if we're looking for liberty, you have to look for Christ. Mm -hmm. True liberty. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And then he goes on to talk about but by love serve one another. Did you know that? That that's, that's all. <laughs> it's like, stand fast in the liberty. Well, I ain't serving nobody, and I ain't going to do that. And these are just rules, and we're just, you know, you're just saying we ought to do this right here. And I don't, I'm free. You know, I'm, I got freedom in Jesus. Stand fast in that liberty, but by love serve one another. Don't use it for an occasion to the flesh to say, I'm free. <laughs> you know? But by love, serve one another. <clears throat> All right. We usually picture the work of Christ as done by a great liberator for us. I mean, think about it. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the great liberator. Where did he liberate us from at? At the cross where he was slaughtered. But where he died to make us free. <clears throat> so we usually picture the work of Christ as done by a great liberator for us apart from any enslavement that might come by incorporation into oneness with him. Meaning he's liberated us and there will not be there is not even the slightest hint of enslavement. And, and by the way, the word servant and serving and all of that, almost always in the New Testament, is not the word hired household servant. Did anybody hear that? It's not, when it tells us to serve or that we are servants, it is not using the word hired household servant. In fact, back then, they didn't have a lot of hired help. You know what I mean? They enslaved people. <clears throat> we may even think that God delivered us from issues of specific sins and actions. In reality, he delivered us unto death in order to cause us to participate in his governing nature within. In other words, in other words, okay. So, I need to erase this. Did everybody get this? This was just incredible chart, wasn't it? <laughs> That's a joke. I want to use my chalk holders. Um, so we say, we, we draw a picture of a person here, and he's got very specific sins. You know, let's say that, uh, what is this? I don't, have, I don't have enough colors here. Right. So he's got specific sins that are shaped like that, a sort of a weird triangle. All right, and then, and then we got this person, and he's got other sins. His sins are sort of like, his sins are like that. All right, and we can keep drawing people with weird something that's different. It's like, what is, what you got wrong with you, man? It's almost like a backwards four or something. You know, we judge, you know what I mean? And we, all this stuff, or well, you look like you got fire burning up your head. <clears throat> all right, so Jesus is over here. 
So we think that Jesus just looks at us, like specifically right here at us, if that's us, and goes, oh, you know, I see that you've really got this problem with backward fours, you know? And so I'm going to deliver you of that and whatever else is, you know, because you don't just have one problem, do you? All right. So, and we, and we do, and so we think he does that with each and every, because it's us personally. But basically, the truth is, he says, here, I want to just gather you all up into me, and I'm going to take you to the cross. He just gathers us all up into himself, and take, and whatever problems you had with your backward fours, or burning hair, or head, or whatever, or whatever weird stuff you got going on, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have to go, oh, well, let me dig around in your garbage and find out exactly what your problem is. Do, I mean, you know, do you kind of know what I'm saying? He just says, I'm taking you to the cross, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you're going to be dead with all of your problems, you know, and death is the answer to the old nature. However it wants to matter. You say, well, I'm an individual. I'm unique. I have unique sins. <laughs> well, you seem pretty proud of that, don't you? <laughs> and so I need Jesus to come in and dig in my dumpster. And, you know, exa you know it's in there, knee deep in it. And, and pull out parts and go, you know, this is really bad, but you know, I think I can help you, you know. No. He takes all of that into himself. He who knew no sin was made to be sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And he takes us to Calvary. All right. That, that's the answer for getting rid of, but it's not the answer, that, let's just say it like this, that's the remedy for getting rid of your burning head problems. It's the remedy, but it's not the answer yet. Still not Christ. Carolyn and I were talking uh, in between classes here, and she said, you know, Adam, even if he was sinless, he's still Adam. It's not Jesus. Well, since most of us only want to deal with Adam because of sins, we never realize that God never wants Adam not cleaned up, not he puts him to death. Don't you realize, excuse me, I don't mean to preach to you pointing at you with chocolate, but don't you realize that God could have just forgiven Adam, but he doesn't forgive Adam. He forgives you of your sins so you won't be punished for them, but then Jesus bears you just like the scapegoat in the Old Testament where all that was wrong with Israel is laid on him and he takes the punishment for it. He is blamed for every ounce of it. He is criminalized. He is looked down at. He is hated. He is, and all, and we talked about this before, but all of the things that we hate when we can see it outside of us, we'll, we'll attack it and we'll, you know, we'll kill it when we can see it outside of us in Jesus. That's wrong. That's bad. That's this, you know. Now we see it in us and we go, oh, but God's grace is dealing with me. You know, we only think of grace concerning us. Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You see it there? But why does he forbid it? On what ground does he forbid it? What? How shall we that are dead? 
how shall we that are dead? How shall we that are dead? He doesn't say, how could you do that? You know what I mean? I mean, that's the way we go. We go down to the altar when we've sinned and we failed and we're there and we go, oh, I'm sorry, I hurt you and I failed you. And we picture God going, how could you do that? I, I trusted you. I really thought you would do good in all your flesh and Adamic nature. I just figured somehow you'd come through for me. He doesn't do that. Oh, he goes, of course you did it. Of course you did. And you'll do it again. You're a mess. For God's sake, get to the cross. Quick, run. <laughs> you know? He doesn't get near as upset as we think he does. I think that sort of soothes us some way, you know. I'm spiritual because I'm admitting I'm yucky and I hurt God. That's spiritual? Anyway. I could say more, but I can say no more. <clears throat> All right, so this chart was precipitated by this sentence. I don't always remember where they came from. <clears throat> we may even think that God delivered us from issues of specific sins and actions. Specific, that he's, he's going, oh, let me, oh, Adam, let me deliver you of that, you know, you're, you're like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that he said, don't eat and don't have anything to do with. Well, that's you. And you got some good fruit and you got some bad fruit and you got some bad hanging off. And you go, oh, Lord, you know, just pull off this bad fruit right here on this branch and pull off this one over here and this. And, and once you get those off, I'll be so much better. There'll be so much good hanging off of me. He was going, I hate that tree. I told you not to eat of it. What are you doing? Why are you trying to present that to me? I'm going to, Jesus, my son is coming and he's going to lay the ax to the root, buddy. Why do you have to be so mean? Because it's the only hope. It's the only hope. I'm almost finished with chocolate here. I love Jesus. <laughs> I love chocolate too. All right. Oh, oh, moved to the wrong side. Jesus doesn't hurt me like that. <clears throat> All right. In reality, he delivered us unto death in order to cause us to participate in his governing nature within. <clears throat> These are the steps set forth in proper order in Romans 6, 11, 13, and 19 that help us discern the process. Number one, consider yourself dead and consider yourself alive through Christ. That's verse 11, right? Reckon yourself, reckon yourself. Consider yourself dead and consider yourself alive through Jesus Christ. That's very specific. Number two, no longer present your members to your former owner because he's dead. Parenthesis, mine. <laughs> because he's dead. <laughs> no, but... but that's why this is verse 13, not verse 11. He has already established the fact that he's dead. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so no longer present your members to your former owner because he's dead. Number three, present yourself as one who died and is alive by Christ. That's verse 19. And then also that verse, present your members as body members. For the life of Christ. Man, you can't, I mean, it can't get any plainer than that then. You know, we say, okay, well, I'm the body of Christ. But we don't have to, that doesn't require us 
to say, and I regularly live by the nature of Christ and the life of Christ. You, you see what I'm saying? I mean, it, it, theologically, we've wrapped it all up so we don't have to say that. Present your members as body members for the life of Christ. Can't run from that one. All right, these things are only possible based on assurance of death and not upon one's level of personal commitment. You know, commitment is talked about a lot, particularly in youth groups. Do you agree? They talk about commitment a lot. You know, the scriptures don't talk about commitment near like what we think they do. They don't. How about I just let you search that one out? Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to reread that. When these things are not only possible, but these things are only possible based on assurance of death and not upon one's level of personal commitment. The words no longer, meaning no longer yield your members, or, you know, I see the words no longer and once, present to us a finality of removal from the former bondages. All is brought to a new view of things, which is in light of the new resurrection reality. When we talk about resurrection, or my weird wording there, new resurrection reality, and sometimes I use weird terminology to break our patterns of, you know, somebody says something and it's all automatically, <laughs> this is what I've always said it is, and it's, you know, somebody might be saying some, <laughs> something completely different. We always apply it to those phrases. <clears throat> um, All is brought to a new view of things, which is in light of the new resurrection reality. The new resurrection reality, as defined by me, because I made up those words together, is an acknowledgement of our death so that now we can be raised unto newness of life, or as the Spanish Bible reads, new life. <laughs> new meaning something new, not Repaired life, or fixed up life, or forgiven life, new life. In light of the new resurrection reality. Oh, if the Holy Spirit could breathe that to us. Really, honestly, the Holy Spirit could just breathe that, even fresh. I mean, it's always new every morning. All rest upon a movement, not just from one kingdom to another, but from death unto life, which describes the realms of each kingdom. The movement is not just from one kingdom from, to another. It is a movement from death into life. And those, those words are actually describing those kingdoms. They're not just exit points or entrance points. They're describing the nature of those kingdoms. And it takes death to get us out of death. A lot of people don't know that, though. You know, They just don't know that it takes death. That through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. Whoa. Whoa. The death involves the putting away of us while the life is the actual life of Christ within us. All right. So what I'm saying, and I've said this maybe once in all my years here or whatever, but <clears throat> what I'm saying is each of us needs to come by the Holy Spirit to a place where one day we go to our own funeral. And it's real to us. It's real to us. It's not just talk and theology and words that sound good, maybe even that the Spirit bears witness to, because the Spirit will bear witness to the truth, and it doesn't mean we have the truth. Him bearing witness to the truth over here 
is not meaning we have it. So, so we, have to, we have to break out of even that. I mean, when I say break out of it, I mean relying on it as this, is, this means I'm okay because the Spirit's bearing witness to that truth that is so real and true to Randy or whatever. You know? <clears throat> it is where, you know, without trying to be morbid, morbid or anything like that, it is where we come in and, and um, we kind of open the casket and we realize, you know what? That's me. Now, it's not that, and you won't experience that, but it is that real where, you know, when you leave that funeral, you'll know, you know what, I'm dead, and Christ is my life, and I'm going to spend the rest of my time taking that from revelation truth to revealed life, Christ revealed in me. And that's the Jesus that I want, not the revelation of that, but him being revealed. And I'll just close with this. Um, it's a good point for right here, too. <clears throat> it talks about putting off the old man. It talks about putting on the new man in the larger picture, in the big picture. There is that reality of the old man, the old nature. We always draw it with a square representing Adam. And all, all that are in Adam. So you got a, it's a big square full of little squares. You know, we're all in Adam. And then the cross. And there Jesus takes this upon himself, this old nature, and he takes us to the cross. Okay? And then we are put to death. And then from that, now we are not Adamites functioning according to our view or according to independence, I'm an independent person with the nature of Adam. No longer that. Now, I'm the body of Christ, the vessel of Jesus. Again, temple, branch, vessel, earthen vessel, um, church, on and on and on, all of the different examples. All right, well, that was true, and Jesus accomplished that at Calvary. Can I get amen? All right. But like in Colossians and in Ephesians, it tells us to put off the old man and to put on the new. What does that mean? That means that this realm, this chart I just drew on the board, this realm has to come off of the chalkboard and into us. Is that okay to say it like that? It is. It's like whatever happened 2,000 years ago that was so incredible and wonderful that Jesus did needs to have the same glory of death and resurrection in us. The same glory and resurrection. I mean, because it's the same thing. It's just the application, the applying of put off. There I see it. Not, you don't see it in you first. You see it in him. Right. Not on a chalkboard, but in him. Right. But the seeing is now your seeing. It is now your cross. It is now your reality. It is now your doctrine. It's not, it's not my doctrine or your doctrine. And it is... It is your, it, 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 become, it defines you. It, it is your, uh, you're identified with it and it defines you so that it's not talk anymore and it's not truth. And, you know, I realize it takes, it takes a while of soaking in this to get it really, I mean, it does. It takes a while. I understand that. But there, there does come a time where that 
not the chart there, but the reality of what Christ did becomes more real to you than what was you, meaning it becomes your identity. It becomes more real to you than what you were. And you find that as that becomes, you know, we say second nature, it's actually first nature, <laughs> but it becomes second nature to you that instead of reacting with Adam and then apologizing and then asking forgiveness, isn't that the same as going to church and coming down to the altar, you know, because we recognize some other sins? It has moved out of the realm of all of that, and now many times you may actually be surprised when Jesus pops out of you. <laughs> you just go, whoa, that was the Lord, you know? You know, I had somebody say that to me recently. They said, man, I, I went into that meeting, and I had this in mind, and I was going to do this, and da-da-da-da, and the Lord just bloop came out. And I've done that. I've done that in meetings. I've done that in meetings where someone really deserved a, 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 a pastor. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they deserved and needed, at, as far as I saw, something right now. And I ended up just loving on them and praying for them and blessing them. And, you know, I said, you know, I went out of the meeting. I said, what was that all about? <laughs> I mean, I did. Like, well, you know, this person is a mess, and they needed so-and-so, you know. And, of course, he would, he'd be going, oh, don't you think I know what he needs since I'm the one who popped out of you, buddy? <clears throat> so, you know, so what does that tell us of, of all of this? What does that tell us? It's not a bunch of doctrines you stuff in there. It's not. It's not all this teaching. Oh, i got to get this teaching. No, i got to get Jesus. Keep your heart pure. Right. You know? Oh, this new creation teaching. Ugh. Yuck. This Holy Spirit breathed teaching of Christ and Him crucified. That's all that we need. It's all that we need. Let's pray. Father, we just love you and we just um, are humbled at your wondrous compass that always points toward your son and how you worked all things all things after the purpose of your will that we be found in Christ that we be conformed to the image of Christ thank you father that we are safe in Jesus no matter how we're doing outwardly but thank you also father that you, that, that you have somehow worked it in us, that we are not just content to be found in you, that we want you found in us. We want you to be able to find your son when you come around these earthen vessels. And so we, we just ask you, we know you're going to be faithful to your vision, as it were, of your son, your mission to form him in us. We, at, we, we just tell you we're with you in your purpose. Holy Spirit, we're with you in your purpose. Father, we're with you. And we tell you, just find ways that we couldn't imagine that will actually do it instead of leave us Leave us in the way that we were before. That's grace, Father, your cross. That's grace. By the grace of God, you tasted death for every man. That's grace, death, tasting death for every man. So thank you for that grace that put us to death in Christ. Now, we ask you for the grace that will reveal that Christ, that same selfless Christ in us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, folks. We're dismissed.